cross one out from the book, ladies and gentlemen, and there's the most obvious joke out of the way from the start. After all this time, I'm finally making a dedicated video about the dwarves. But not just any dwarf, no, no, no. Today, we cover the High King of the Dwarfs. Because everyone loves dwarfs, even the elf simp that I am, I have to admit dwarves have earned their pretty much universal acclaim. I still think most of you are sleeping on the pointy ears, but the dwarves are certainly getting the appreciation they deserve. Regardless, though, I'm gonna stop simping for elves for at least most of this video. Instead, ready the heavy book and quill you have and prepare to return the dwarves to greatness because it's time to learn the tale of Thorgrim Grudgebearer. The Age of Reckoning is upon us and woe betide everyone who would call this man short. Short? It's so funny to me that him yelling short has recently become his characterization. Like I just love the idea you can't mention anything related to something being lesser in height without Thorgrim bursting through the walls and threatening to cut your knees off. But moving past that, it's serious lore time. This is a serious channel for serious people. Thorgrim Grudgebearer was the son of the sister of the then dwarf high king, Alrickson. He was groomed by his uncle to take the throne. See, there's something really unfortunate about how words change meaning over time, because I guarantee you until I finished that sentence, you were thinking something else. Like in this case, Thorgrim's uncle wasn't a discord mod, it's groomed as in groomed to become the high king, like I said. Dwarfs don't think nepotism is a dirty thing. But no, I say he was groomed and you don't think, ah, prepared for a position of power, or even Thorgrim's uncle was really obsessed with keeping his family's beards in top condition. What the hell was I talking about? Oh, yeah, young Thorgrim. So Thorgrim as a young lad was already in the running to become high king. Not too much additional info on his childhood, but we can infer he had a decent early life as a dwarf, given that there's no mention of his family having anything crop up like some joining the Slayer cult or goblins burning his wife and child. If that second one sounds oddly specific, that's because it is. Don't worry about it though, we're talking about a different dwarf today. That being said, Thorgrim would find himself coming to power perhaps sooner than he would have in a non-war game setting. Alrickson had helped the Empire in the Great War against Chaos, where the guy before Archaon tried to give everyone a good once-over. He was stopped but at heavy cost, including several grievous wounds that weren't in any rush to heal themselves. In addition, he had been watching the goings-ons of the dwarfs and came to a rather startling realization. Aside from the obvious, like sheer distance keeping everyone apart, many dwarf holds had become increasingly insular. They had become solely preoccupied with their own struggles rather than trying to help the dwarf race as a whole. It had become more and more apparent that the dwarfs were lacking a sense of greater unity. While sometimes this is understandable, I mean you can hardly expect a hole to send out a full army to help the cause when there's more orcs than blades of grass outside their walls, others were doing things like protecting their hoarded gold with an obsession that bordered on psychotic. All that being said, Alric said was kind of a kick-ass king and himself didn't show any sign of slowing down in his age. Though old and weary after all that had happened, especially the fight against chaos, he was not going to go die in a corner while being unable to help the dwarfs one last time. So he can Conveyed a council of kings, where all the kings and royals of the dwarfs meet together to talk shit and get ready to convene a new high king. Alrickson told the assembled short kings that he would bequeath the role of high king to whoever could perform the greatest deeds befitting a king in a year's time, to the roaring approval of those assembled. The dwarfs needed not just a strong king, but one that would foster unity and renewed spirit, and Alrickson was going to make damn sure he could find the right one. Surely enough, a year later they all reconvened, and I gotta say, this is breakneck speed for dwarfs. This all happened in a year, these bastards usually take 50 years to do anything. Many dwarfs returned with proof of the epic deeds they performed of that year that showed why they should be the next High King. Ungrim Ironfist killed a massive giant, which isn't terribly administrative or anything, but he's the king of the suicidal maniac hold, so he's doing what he knows, I guess. Belgar Ironhammer had continued chipping away at Carrick Eight Peaks during this year, so he got some pretty loud applause, too. Retaking one room of that godforsaken shithole is a massive accomplishment, so I could see that being a big deal among the dwarfs. But as the decision was about to be made, Thorgrim himself walked into the room. All present had thought him dead, but instead he had returned with more triumph than any other. Because with him wasn't just the corpse of a big monster he stabbed. Really, any human with a big enough gun could have done the same thing. No, he came into the meeting hall with a delegation of Norse dwarfs who had been thought lost to the invasions of chaos thousands of years ago. Thorgrim single-handedly brought them back to the rest of the Karazhan Corps. Oh sure, they sung praises of how he had gone slaying monster after monster, but by finding them, he showed he was more than just a beat stick. Plus, he had done something that for dwarfs is second to none, reclaimed lost artifacts of hold long since thought inaccessible to him. And you gotta understand something about dwarfs, especially Warhammer ones. If something is old enough, it's more or less a religious object for that reason alone. 
Their ancestor worship is such that almost anything old enough they create is revered, and with that in mind, Thorgrim basically walked in with relics of like 50 different saints as well as the descendants of said saints. Plus, consider that asking a dwarf to leave their home is something difficult at the best of times. These dwarfs would have been in constant fighting with the Chaos worshippers of Norska, and he still convinced them to send some people with him to ultimately do little more than help Thorgrim win a political contest. Yeah, contact with the rest of the dwarfs could open up alliances and trade, but at the end of the day, this is all to prove his worthiness as king. He was already well like before this, but this showed that as High King, he would do more than just stab things and be angry. He would get things done. He gave a speech about how he would do more than keep the dwarfs alive for another regency, more than just take back a few holds from goblins and kill some elves for being stupid knife-eared assholes. Any dwarf worth their salt could do that. No, Thorgrim's aims were bigger. He wanted the entire Great Book of Grudges wiped clean, and he vowed to do it. Every single wrong done to the dwarfs since the beginning of time was to be righted. And you know, as much as I love my elves and Eldar, I don't think there's been a single one who can make a proclamation as badass as Thorgrim did here. Ulrich had died shortly after. The stubborn bastard was determined to suck up the pain until a new High King was crowned, and none were more promising than Thorgrim. Thorgrim became the High King, and as is tradition with the coolest people in Warhammer Fantasy, he personally led a campaign to white out Greenskins and Blackfire Pass. It's like a rite of passage at this point. Sigmar did it, Karl Franz did it, Thorgrim did it. Shame the High Elves are half a continent and half an ocean away, because it would have been cool if Tyrion did something there. But Thorgrim was successful and trade with the Empire was secured. Surely enough, Thorgrim went straight to work righting wrongs against humans, elves, chaos, the undead, and most of all, the Green Tide. During this campaign in Blackfire Pass, several high-profile grudges were struck out of the book. The Age of Reckoning had begun, and Thorgrim was going to see the dwarfs not just survive, but prosper. Wearing armor covered in the finest protection runes, wielding one of the very axes Grimnir himself once held, and going into battle atop his throne carrying the Great Book of Grudges itself, Thorgrim is carried into battle striking down any who would come close to him. It's amazing, because while he's fighting, he's not just shit-talking. Oh, certainly, he's making sure any orcs that come his way know that they're garbage and will always be garbage, but the entire time he's fighting, he's striking away grudges in the book during a battle. Can you imagine how much of a morale booster and or destroyer that is? Like, if you're a dwarf in this setting, grudges are almost everything. They are to be righted without any thought, it's as simple as that. So here comes the king of your entire race, except for a few outliers, striking out wrong after wrong as the battle goes on, and not infrequently doing it personally. That's the single biggest boost to your fighting spirit you could hope to get, short of Grimnir himself showing up on the battlefield. Meanwhile, the enemy is sitting there and watching this guy list every single thing they've done wrong in their life, remove himself from the battle for a moment, scratch something out of a book, and then get right back to braining their warlord before repeating the process. That's peak shit right here. Franz is the end-all be-all of rulership in Warhammer, but Thorgrim's not far behind him. He's also a very diplomatic and unorthodox fella, at least for a dwarf. Sure, he doesn't really like new things, and he does look down on other races from time to time. Karl Franz presented some engineering designs to Thorgrim once, and Thorgrim responded by saying that they were wonderful designs, and he can't wait to see what the Empire's adults can come up with, so that was a bit rude. But at the end of the day, when shit's going down, Thorgrim's willing to at least hear every single thing at the table and consider its usage, no matter how new it is. While I don't believe it was ever connected to him, Malachi McKyson from Gotrick and Felix had one hell of an operation going on to construct the Spirit of Grugni, his massive zeppelin. I'll admit that this isn't stated in lore anywhere I could find and that I could be entirely wrong, but I fully believe Thorgrim himself gave the approval for this operation. It was such a massive industrial undertaking with so many supplies, engineers, and guards involved that there was no way Thorgrim wasn't at least given a heads up about it, which I think shows that he's willing to work with more radical engineers if he thinks there's truly potential. Plus, while Finnebar the Phoenix King was the one making the opening moves of diplomacy with the dwarfs, Thorgrim's the one who gave him the time of day, showing he was willing to talk it out in situations that lesser kings might have just started stabbing in. You heard me right, folks. Thorgrim Grudgebearer had the revolutionary idea to not stab every single elf he ever came across. You don't get more forward thinking than that. This extends to the rest of his policies as well. His method of handling grudges was far kinder than most other dwarf high kings. You may have heard the tale of the dwarfs who slaughtered an imperial town because the humans had shorted the dwarfs a few coins in payment, almost certainly by accident. Thorgrim doesn't do that. He's more than willing to sit down, look at a grudge, and ask the question, do I really need to kill someone over this? If the answer is yes, then he will. But if the matter can be solved with coin or some other form of reparation, he's more than happy to do so that way. 
This attitude isn't strictly speaking unique to Thorgrim, but for their High King, I feel it makes him stand out even more. Anyways, a tragic thing about Thorgrim is that the End Times come sooner for him than many other characters, and out of every single End Times death, his is perhaps the most infuriating. I mean, aside from the death of the entire setting, but Thorgrim's death in particular is of note for how mind-bogglingly stupid it is. I'll give you the story leading up to it so you can really appreciate how awful this turns out to be. See, despite his best efforts, Thorgrim was still having trouble getting everyone unified. While he and a few others wanted to violently charge out into the fray and cripple chaos on the undead, potentially at the expense of the Dwarfen race itself, most others wanted to instead retake the holds and wipe them clean of greenskins. Eliathra, the daughter of Tyrion and Elariel, was meanwhile visiting the dwarf holds and even had an honor guard of dwarfs. Things were going well until Manfred von Karstein decided to be himself and ruin things, so he kidnapped her to be sacrificed to bring back Nagash. Despite two armies of elves and dwarfs' best efforts, Manfred was successful in his amber alerting. Tyrion called Thorgrim a useless fuckwad and nearly caused the elves and dwarfs to start fighting, but Thorgrim managed to calm everyone down and told Tyrion that next time there would be no help from dwarfs in their fight against the undead. Then he took his massive army and went to go retake some holds. And to give the end time some credit, he does a decent job at it. Carrot Cake Pete's is probably the highlight before the... low light. Yeah, that is the best YouTube original writing you will ever hear. Well, ultimately, it was taken by the Greenskins and Skaven before being blown up by doors to prevent them from infesting it for all time, Thorgrim himself manages to kill Queek Headtaker. Queek had killed Belagar Ironhammer, so no, it isn't just hard to take back that place in Total Warhammer, it sucks in lore too for the guy. But Thorgrim wasn't about to take this lying down. And to top it off, when Teclis did his great oopsie-daisy in Ulthuan, the magical wind of metal first bound itself to Thorgrim Grudgebearer. Indeed, it went to him before Gelt for reasons. Probably shit one, but hey, he's got it now. So Thorgrim fights Queek, and while Queek puts up a good fight, he still gets absolutely demolished. And remember what I said earlier about Thorgrim listing off grudges as he fights? The entire time he's tossing Queek around like a sack of potatoes, he's listing off every single thing the Red had ever done to get himself a spot in the book. And as he caps it off with the death of Belagar Ironhammer, he puts Queek down for good by snapping his neck. You know, the more I talk about the end times, the more I realize the funny thing about it. Between this, Setra screaming he does not serve, and other things like Nagash's initial return and the shit show that causes, there's so many cool moments in it. Can you imagine a single better way for a dwarf to kill a character than that? But at the end of the day, it's still shit. And sure enough, the shitstorm is about to hit Category 5 because Thorgrim was weary from his wounds and the dwarfs were beginning to retreat despite Thorgrim's victory. So Thorgrim dips out and enters a secret passageway to get away, whereupon he is slain and has his head removed as a trophy by Deathmaster Snitch. Now, I want to make something clear. The idea that the One Piece rat kills someone important during all of this is an anathema to me. He's the single greatest assassin in the entire Warhammer world. I mean, it's bound to happen, and it should happen. It'll suck for fans of the guy he kills, but that's the price of the plot moving forward. But in this case, it is the single stupidest thing imaginable. Let's put aside several glaringly obvious flaws in this first. Put aside the fact that Thorgrim apparently just didn't have any kind of bodyguard during this, or if he did, then they were clearly the most incompetent assholes on the planet. Let's put aside that despite his injuries, he still had the lore of metal coursing through him and should have been able to do any number of magical things to counteract Snitch. Let's even put aside that his armor has magical runes on it whose sole purpose is to prevent a backstab like this from happening. Let's put all that aside. The reason the Skaven was able to reach him was because he had forgotten to close the doorway to the passage behind him, so the rat just waltzed in, stabbed him, and left. Are you, are you kidding me? That's how you kill him. You give him one of the single coolest scenes imaginable, and then go, Ah, shit, sorry guys, he forgot to close his back door. Snicked watched in, whistling Dixie, and stabbed him in the asshole. Say goodbye to Thorgrim, everyone. God damn it, I hate the end times. <laughs> Originally, I'd written a big old paragraph about the end times, but yeah, I've complained about them enough. You all know how I feel about them by this point. Anyway, there's no sign of him in Age of Sigmar. To be honest, I think that's all right. If anyone deserved to rest after all this, it was him. Then, with the Old World coming eventually, he'll most likely be involved in some capacity. He was in the Great War Against Chaos, after all. So rest assured, because we're almost certainly not done with the Grudge Bearer just yet. Either way, to end, let's do a quick little do-or-don't Thorgrim Grudge Bearer for Total War. Thorgrim, as you'd expect, is the premier legendary lord for the dwarfs. For lore positives, if you want to bring about the revengeance of the dwarfs thousands of years in the making, he's one of the best choices. If you hate elves, and I mean really hate elves, then go with Grom Brindle, but otherwise, Thorgrim's probably your best bet. And of course, if you want to go waving your dick around as the end-all, be-all faction leader, he's the high king of the dwarfs and therefore a leader of one of the Warhammer Fantasy good guy factions. For gameplay positives, his starting effects buff hammers and extend his leadership aura a pretty hefty amount. And by picking him as your faction, 
faction leader, you get a whole slew of nice buffs, like grudges having additional goodies when they're resolved, diplomacy benefits, and some upkeep reductions for some of your mainline late game units, which is very nice. He starts at where else but Karaza Karak, the ever peak of the dwarfs, and it's got some nifty things to get you started, like a gem mine for an income boost and 10 slots to make one hell of a city with. He's reasonably close to a few dwarfen allies, and once you go past Blackfire Pass, the Empire of Man is there to lend you some fire support if you need it. Or at the very least, tank Vlad zombies while you deal with the greenskins. As you level him up, his special skills include giving his army leadership and melee attack bonuses against all other factions, industry and research benefits, and even making his army fight harder if he's been wounded. His grudges are all about fighting Queek and Skarsnik, as well as capturing a few specific lost holds. Very fitting for his lore, though I kinda wish he had more focus on the general greenskin race as a whole. Skarsnik specifically feels like Belagar's thing. Thorgrim should be wiping out greenskins regardless of the one in charge. On the con side, well, for lore, I guess if you don't like dwarfs, then you won't like Thorgrim. Kind of a nothing statement, but I struggle with downsides for him. He has all the strong points of the dwarfs while avoiding the worst of their negative aspects. He's a pretty damn cool dude. Granted, if you want full-on, no quarter given, vengeance, vengeance, beard, vengeance all the time, then you might not like Thorgrim, but I do like Thorgrim, so... Ugh. If you don't like the idea of holding grudges and seeking vengeance, then you probably also don't want to pick him, but if that's the case, why are you even here? We're discussing Warhammer Fantasy Dwarfs, I don't know what you expected. Gameplay cons, though? Yeah, there's reasons to avoid him. He starts in a similar situation to Karl Franz, but arguably worse off. Karaza Karak is surrounded by greenskins, wood elves, and the undead. Go far enough south and you can throw the Skaven and fucking Scarbrand into the mix as well. There's also Scrag the Slaughterer to his west, which I guess he has an even shot at fighting Gelt as he does you, so that's something. While Thorgrim doesn't have to deal with the annoying Imperial Authority system, many of the dwarfs around him are likely to be wiped out by Greenskin and Skaven, and the amount of dwarf factions they have to bowl through to get to you is far smaller than the amount of Empire factions Vlad or Archeon have to get through before they reach Franz. Aside from cutting you off from allies, at least early game, you better be ready to fight battle after battle in your home province. And while I'll hold off on discussing gameplay negatives that are more for the dwarfs at large for their own do or don't, Thorgrim's buff affects some units that, while very good, aren't really standouts. What I mean by that is while hammers and longbeards are going to be mainstays of your army, they're not super interesting to play around with. Sit them near the artillery and wait for the enemy to come to you is what you want to do with them most of the time. He does give some boosts to artillery, but they're very minor. This is not exactly a riveting buff. He's the default dwarf leader, so I don't think he should be penalized too harshly for this. After all, the default dwarf guy should probably help default units. But compare him to Ungram buffing Slayers, and it's understandable to see Thorgrim as one of the less interesting lords, gameplay-wise. Also, he's slow, but that's to be expected. On top of being a dwarf, he's being carried around on the world's most decked-out mobility scooter. That shouldn't be surprising. And that is Thorgrim Grudgebearer, another one of my fantasy favorites. Honestly, though, it's kind of a two-parter thing with Thorgrim for why I like him. Well, yes, he does break the mold of the typical dwarf in fantasy, and that's always the kind of thing I like in characters. I also just like him because he's goddamn cool. He's carried into battle holding a massive book and calls out everyone for how their great-great-great-grandpa wronged him. That's awesome. That's why I like the dwarfs in Warhammer in general, truth be told. Thank you to my wonderful channel members. You are the book of grudges to my Thorgrim Grudgebearer. You give me ample opportunity to complain to the high heavens, though unlike Thorgrim, I am eternally grateful for it. If you'd like to support the channel, feel free to subscribe or become a member. Also, I've been streaming a lot more recently. I'm trying to figure out what a good schedule for it would be to get some consistency. But in the meantime, you can find the streams right here on this channel at completely random intervals whenever the mood strikes me. I'm staring at my phone half the time because I still don't have a second monitor and can't read the chat any other way. So be rest assured, the streams are just as scuffed as the actual videos are. Either way though, thank you for watching and take care out there. It still hurts my brain about how Thorgrim and Peppa Pig's dad have the same voice actor. That That's weird, right? Surely it's not just me thinking, yeah, that's pretty messed up, isn't it? Does this mean Peppa Pig's dad is racist? Does Thorgrim have a daughter who's also the star of a children's cartoon? Do I only remember this because Peppa Pig sounds vaguely like a VTuber's name? I don't know the answer to these questions. I just know my brain is filled with nothing but crap and this isn't helping it.